Welcome to our uh, presentation. Um, my name is Salvador Gomez, and um, we're going to study this again. Um, and the reason for it is because last week when we tried to to study it, I was using a different program. I was using PowerPoint. And I think there was a glitch. Didn't really get to go through everything. On top of that, the Lord impressed upon my mind to add a little bit. Uh, I think last week it was about a, a half an hour. We should be good with um, with uh, at least an hour. I want to say about an hour of, of material here. Uh, but again, we're going to be going through... Um, the life of William Miller, the importance of uh, of knowing who he was, and it's just a little bit. It's not in depth. Uh, there's a whole lot more written about him, um, which would be good if we can go through on our own time as well uh, to find those things that are said about him. Um, but without further ado, we're going to continue um, and see what is written about him and why it's important for us to know. Okay, He was an American reformer and um, we're going to look at Proverbs twenty two twenty eight. The Bible says, remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers <coughs> have set up. And um, what's a landmark? That would be if we were to go to <coughs> to Washington, D.C. There are quite a few uh, landmarks there. Um, what's a what's the word for landmark in in Spanish? Uh, ¿Cómo se llaman estas figuras aquí, Rocío? ¿Cuáles? Estas que se ven aquí. ¿Monumentos? Son monumentos, ok. Es, diría yo, es otra palabra que se puede usar. Uh -huh. yeah. Este... Take a little pause here. <laughs> Probably, uh, Probably, yeah. Puede ser que el gato lo está mordiendo. mordiendo. Yeah. Um, these landmarks are important, right? Este, son importantes estos monumentos uh, un monumento histórico es uh -huh. ahora la palabra este, traducida en este momento no, no llega a la mente ¿verdad? este landmark este y and these landmarks are important right um, it lets us know uh, that there's a history behind it, and it also lets us know where we are, right? Mm -hmm. And so without these landmarks, if we were to go to these different places where these landmarks are and we destroy them, that would make things difficult if we wanted to know where we were, and it would also, uh, in a sense, destroy history, right? Because these are his historical. And so likewise in the Bible, um, the Bible says, remove not the ancient landmark. Um, there are, in the, in the Bible, given to us uh, different landmarks that let us know where we are in time. Um, and that these landmarks should not be removed um, at all. Otherwise, we 
it loses our bearings. We lose a, a sense of where we are in time. And we're going to see that in the prophecy. We're going to study those things as well. But William Miller is a reformer that is a landmark himself. We're going to see why. Um, the story of William Miller brings to us, uh, brings to our attention, fact of uh, the fact that we're living at the end of time um, and we'll see that as we study the things that were given to him or the prophecies that were brought before him and so here we have a quote from early writings page 188 paragraph 2 and this quote is about how to receive the first and second angels messages these are messages that we're going to study um we're going to look into but here um, alan white who was a person that heard the messages received the messages and lived throughout that time that these messages were being given she gives us under inspiration um, the instruction as to how to receive them. Okay, so this is going to be important for us, uh, not only for us, but for those that are listening, for those that are following along in our presentations um, through Facebook and YouTube. Uh, you have to understand this this instruction. And so let's play close close attention uh, to this instruction it says in like manner those who have had no experience in the first and second angels messages must receive them from others who had an experience and followed down through the messages okay so who do we receive them from from those who had an experience in them and so we're gonna find out as we study these things it, this isn't this isn't gonna be something that I studied out because I wasn't alive when they were given right so we have to listen to those that were alive William Miller being one um, that actually gave the messages Does that make sense and then it says, as Jesus was rejected, so I saw that these, the first and second angel's message, I saw that these messages have been rejected. And as the disciples declared that there is salvation in no other name under heaven given, excuse me, under heaven given among men, so also should the servants of God faithfully and fearlessly warn those who embrace but part of the truth. Okay? So the warning is that you can't embrace only part. Okay? All of the messages need to be embraced. That they must gladly receive all the messages as God has given them or have no part in the matter. Okay? So, if we're going to say that we're giving the first and second angels messages, we must first receive them from those that had an experience. That's number one. And number two is that all of these messages, everything that was being taught, everything that was being said, must be embraced by those that hear it. Or else, you don't have a, a part in giving them. You can't give them unless you receive all of it, right? If I were to give you uh, a cake and say, this cake is for you, you have to eat it all. Does that mean that you're only going to eat part of it? No, you're going to eat all of it, right? And so likewise here, there's, a, there's messages that God gave at, uh, in these first and second angels messages that must be embraced in all of its entirety right just like the when paul said all scripture is necessary so likewise 
all messages mm -hmm. under the first and second angel message are necessary. Okay? And so here's a little bit about William Miller. Uh, he was born in February 15th. 1782, I think uh, Tomas said that his birthday is on the same day, right? Mm -hmm. Not the same year, the same day, well, February 15th. Wow. Mm -hmm. And December 20, 18, 1849, when's your birthday? But in February. Yes. So yours is, comes before his. Oh no, his comes before yeah, yours. Okay. Yeah. The last year 28th, 15th. Oh yeah, we did it together. That's right. That's right. We had a little recognition uh, for your birthdays. That's right. Okay, and so December 20th, 1849, he was laid to rest. Okay. He was a Baptist preacher from the United States who is credited with beginning the mid 19th century or 1840s, 1840s uh, in North America religious movement that was known as the Millerites and I added the Great Advent Movement or the Great Awakening as well. You could look these things up in uh, uh, your search engine and you should bring up quite a bit of information. But it's always best to receive uh, the information that's of vital importance through them themselves, through their writings, through their publications, because they wrote extensively on the things that God was revealing to them at that time. And so the early life of William Miller says shortly after his move to Poultney, Miller rejected his Baptist his Baptist heritage and became a deist and if you remember we we said that um, and we'll see here in a little bit as well he's also gonna say something about um, the deistic belief but those that believe as a deist believe in God but they believe that God created everything and walked away from it far from from humanity and kind of just let it evolve on its own okay it says in his biography Miller records his con conversion I became acquainted with the principal men in that village Polney Vermont who were professedly deists but they were good citizens and of a moral and serious deportment and so in other words this is what caused him to become familiar with uh, being a deist, uh, he ran into people that believed it and because of the way they lived, mm -hmm. because they were morally speaking in good standing, uh, he adopted the same viewpoint. And he was also in the military. Uh, notice this quote says at the outbreak of the war of 1812 Miller raised a company of local men and traveled to Burlington Vermont he transferred to the 30th infantry regiment in the regular army of the United States with the rank of lieutenant Miller spent most of the work or I'm sorry Miller spent most of the war working as a recruiter and on February 1st 1814 take note of the dates he was promoted to captain he saw his first action at the battle of Plattsburgh so this battle if you look it up it's very uh, it's a famous battle that took place in the United States in the years um, the date here mentioned 9 uh, September 6 1814 um, and for some reason I forgot to put when how long it lasted it lasted all the way to uh, September 11th of the same year 1814 but the date that is known the most is actually September 11th uh, where it ended 
It says, where vastly outnumbered American forces overcame the British. The fort I was in was exposed to, the, to every shot. Bombs, rockets, and shrapnel shells fell as thick as hailstones, he said. One of these many shots had exploded two feet from him, wounding three of his men and killing another. But Miller survived without a scratch. Miller came to view the outcome of this battle as miraculous and therefore at odds with his deistic view of a distant God far removed from human affairs. And so there it is. When this happened, when this miracle took place in his life, it was a mystery to him that these bombs would be dropping right in front of him and that nothing would happen to him. He saw one of his his comrades, one of his uh, soldier friends, die right in front of him because of those same bombs. And so uh, it was a mystery and it made him think. It made him think about, is God really that far away? Because that God must have intervened in some way or another. He later wrote, it seemed to me that the Supreme Being must have watched over the interests of this country in a, in a special manner and delivered us from the hands of our enemies. So surprising a result against such odds did seem to me like the work of a mightier power than man. And so a very important date, September 11th, 1814 we see this miracle taking place and um, this is going to be very important as we continue in the studies because there's another important date that we'll look at uh, which is um, has to do with prophecy as well on September 11th let's go forward uh, William Miller was also a Freemason does everybody know what a Freemason is? Uh, they are somewhat of a secret society, if you want to put it that way, right? Uh -huh. A lot of presidents were Freemasons. And so, because of his deistic views, he ran into men that were Freemasons, seemed to be uh, morally um, uh, respected. And so, this is what brought him in but notice what it says here Miller was an active Freemason until 1831 okay and Miller resigned his Masonic membership in 1831 stating that he did so to avoid fellowship with any practice that may be incompatible incom excuse me with the word of God among Masons Okay, so he wanted to make sure that he was following uh, what he was learning, the things that he had studied in the Bible. Um, he saw that it was best for him to no longer be a Freemason. And so, um, why is this important? Uh, many times you will hear when they talk about William Miller, they're going to say that the founder of the Adventist movement was part a, of a uh, secret society but they don't mention that he actually denounced uh, Freemasonry when he became more familiar with uh, the teachings of the Bible okay so this is important this is important to know that he didn't remain a Freemason for the entirety of his life. He ended up giving Freemasonry up for the cause of God. Okay. Uh, notice Genesis 2.8 um, which tells us about the first farmer. Okay. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. 
And so who was the first farmer? It says, the, it says, the, oh, yeah, 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 Adam. Let me read it slowly. And the Lord God planted. God was the first part of God, yeah. Oh, really? See, the difference between, if we don't read it, if we don't sl slow down a little bit when we read. That's why he says to the Yeah. Okay. And he taught Adam, right? He told Adam, you, you're going to dress it. You're going to take care of it. Okay. So Adam was a farmer. We're not denying that. But the first farmer was God. It was God that planted, right? He, he laid the seed, made sure that the, the, the plants grew. The work of a farmer. Okay? And so was William Miller. He was a farmer. Notice this verse, or this quote, taken from Great Controversy, 317, paragraph 1. An upright, honest-hearted farmer who had been led to doubt the divine authority of the scriptures. And as a, a believer in deism, he rejected... You know, the, the thought that God was able to instruct humans, right? Because he's, he, he believed that, like his friends, God, God was far from the interactions of, of man. Yet, who sincerely desired to know the truth was the man specially chosen of God to lead out in the proclamation of Christ's second coming. And so the main, the, the, or you can say the meat and potatoes of the first angel's message was that Christ was soon to come. Imminent. That Christ was about to come. Okay? That was the main subject. Like many other reformers, William Miller had in his early life battled with poverty and had thus learned the great lessons of energy and self-denial. Okay, this is what he learned he learned in his early life. The members of the family from which he sprang were characterized by an independent, liberty-loving spirit, by capability of endurance, and ardent patriotism, traits which were also prominent in his character. His father was a captain in the army of the revolution and to the sacrifices which he made in the struggles and sufferings of that stormy period may be traced uh, the, the strained circumstances of William or Miller's early life. And so we can see that all of these things uh, actually, um, what's the word I want to use here? All of these things influenced uh, William Miller's life and prepared him for um, what was soon to take place as he discovered the prophecies of the Bible. Now notice this verse in Proverbs 22.6. We had mentioned it a little bit in our Bible class this morning. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And so even though William Miller at some point denied um, his beliefs as a Christian, his beliefs in Christendom, uh, he didn't deny it completely, right? He didn't deny God as, um, as an atheist would. He just didn't believe that God was uh, interacting with men. But this changed as he continued to study. Notice what we read about his mother. His mother was a woman of sterling piety. And in childhood, he had been subject to religious impressions. In early manhood, however... 
He was thrown into the society of Deus, whose influence was the stronger from the fact that they were mostly good citizens. And so in other words, what does it say about Christian Christendom at the time? It wasn't planning out for him. It wasn't making sense that these men that that were deists were actually um, carrying themselves in a better way. You know, they were they were actually giving a better testimony than the Christians. Okay, so this is important, right? We need to be able to give a good testimony in order for for people to believe us. You know, for people for us to have an influence on people. Um, we better live up to the life that God gives us. And so notice, uh, this is why he became a deist, because of these uh, men that he ran into. Living as they did in the midst of Christian institutions, their characters had been, to some extent, molded by their surroundings. For the el excellencies which won them respect and confidence, they were indebted to the Bible. And yet these good gifts were so perverted as to exert an influence against the word of God. This is talking about what he saw in the Christian churches, which is why he denounced it. By association with these men, Miller was led to adopt their sentiments. The current interpretations of scripture presented difficulties which seemed to him insurmountable. Yet his new belief, while setting aside the Bible, offered nothing better to take his place. And he remained far from satisfied. And so just a little bit, just so we can get a good idea of one of those things that uh, most churches believed at that time. Is that um, uh, if, if you did not live up to what you believe if you did not want to accept Jesus Christ there's the preaching of fire and brimstone which means that when you die you go straight to hell that's what the majority of the churches taught back then and that did not portray to him and it's I'm pretty sure we would all agree that doesn't portray, portray a loving God right and so this, to him, was contradictory to, you know, to a, a, a loving God that they said they believed in. And that's just one example. The, apart from that, more than likely it was because of the way uh, most Christians lived at that time. It says here, uh, the current interpretation of scripture presented difficulties which seemed to him insurmountable. Yet his new belief, while setting aside the Bible, offered nothing better to take his place and he remained far from satisfied. He continued to hold these views, however, for about 12 years. But at the age of 34, this is 1816, the Holy Spirit impressed his heart with the sense of his condition as a sinner and found in his former belief no assurance of happiness beyond the grave. And so this takes us to uh, the second phase. But let's look at John 16, 7 and, and 8. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. This is Christ uh, letting them, letting the disciples know that it was best for him to leave. The reason why is for if I go not away, the Comforter or the Holy Spirit will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Verse 8, And when he has come, this is the work that he would do, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And this is exactly what was going taking place in the life of William Miller. His conversion experience as we just read. And notice his conviction. The future was dark and gloomy. Referring afterward to his feelings at this time. He said, Annihilation was a cold and chilling thought. 
and accountability was sure destruction to all. The heavens were as brass over my head, and the earth as iron under my feet. Eternity, what was it? And death, why was it? The more I reasoned, the further I was from demonstration. The more I thought, the more scattered were my conclusions. I tried to stop thinking, but my thoughts would not be controlled. I was truly wretched, but did not understand the cause. I murmured and complained, but knew not of whom. I knew that there was a wrong, but knew not where, did not know how or where to find the right. I mourned, but without hope. And so, at this point, he found the answer to his prayer, uh, which are represented in these verses, John 5.39 and John 12.32. The Bible says, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And then John 12, 32. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This is what William Miller found as a result. After studying the, the scriptures, he found a loving Savior. In the state, he continued for some months. Suddenly, he says, the character of the Savior was vividly impressed upon my mind. It seemed that there might be a, a being so good and compassionate as to himself atone for our transgressions and thereby save us from suffering and the penalty of sin. I immediately felt how loving, how lovely such a being must be and imagined that I could cast myself into the arms of and trust the mercy of such a one. But the question arose, how can it be proved that such a being does exist? Aside from the Bible, I found that I could get no evidence of the existence of such a savior or even a future state. I saw that the Bible did bring to view such a, such a savior as I needed, and I was perplexed to find how an inspiration uninspired book should develop principles so perfectly adapted to the wants of a fallen world. I was constrained to admit that the scriptures must be a revelation from God. They became my delight and in Jesus I found a friend. The Savior became to me the chiefest among ten thousand and the scriptures which before were dark and contradictory now became the lamp to my feet and a light to my path. My mind became settled and satisfied. I found the Lord God to be a rock in the midst of the ocean of life. The Bible now became my chief study, and I can truly say I searched it with great delight. I found that the half was never told me. I wondered why I had not seen its beauty and glory before and marveled that I could have ever rejected it. I found everything revealed that my heart could desire and a remedy for every disease of the soul. I lost all taste for other reading and applied my heart to get wisdom from God. Okay, so this is talking about his conversion. Uh, he no longer rejected the Bible. He actually embraced it. He understood it. God uh, opened his mind so that he can understand and he also as he states here he found that the half was never told him um, he was able to understand uh, a lot more than what he did when he was a Baptist now uh, this brings us to his public confession, which is found in Romans 10, 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Notice what William Miller said, or what it says about William Miller in Great Controversy 319, paragraph 3. 
Miller publicly prof professed his faith in the religion which he had despised, but his infidel associates were not slow to bring forward all those arguments which he himself had often urged against the divine authority of the scriptures. He was not then prepared to answer them, but he reasoned that if the Bible is a revelation from God, it must be consistent with itself, and, and that as it was given for man's instruction, it must be adapted to, the, to his understanding. He determined to study the scriptures for himself and ascertain if every apparent contradiction could not be harmonized. Okay. Notice William Miller's uh, library. Endeavoring to lay aside all preconceived opinions. And this is what we must do as well. Uh, many times we try to study the scriptures under our own understanding, our own uh, preconceived opinions. And when we do not lay those things aside they're going to get in the way of what the Bible actually teaches. Uh, so he, lay as, he laid aside all his pre <coughs> he laid aside all his preconceived opinions. That was the first step. And then it says dispensing with commentaries. It means he didn't uh, look for anybody else um, comments on what the scripture taught. He compared scripture with scripture by the aid of the marginal references and concordances this is called proof text he was comparing the scriptures with themselves he per pursued his study in a regular and methodical manner beginning with genesis reading verse by verse he proceeded no faster than the meaning of the several passages so unfolded as to leave him free from all embarrassment and so that just means that he made sure, before he read the next verse, he made sure that he understood the verse that he was reading. He didn't just read through superficially. He made sure that he understood what each verse meant. Okay? And then it says, uh, When he found anything obscure, it was his custom to compare it with every other text which seemed to have any reference to the matter under consideration. Again, proof text. Every word was permitted to have its proper bearing upon the subject of the text, and if his view of it harmonized with every collateral passage, it ceased to be a difficulty. It explained that obscure thing that he didn't understand by proof texting it, by looking at in a, looking for it in other verses. Thus, whenever he met with a passage hard to be understood, he found an explanation in some other portion of the scriptures. As he studied with earnest prayer for divine enlightenment, that which he had before appeared dark to his understanding was made clear. He experienced the truth of the psalmist's words. Thy words of that, the entrance of thy words give it light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. Now notice the, the method of study. This is found in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so when we study the word of God, this should be our aim, that we should uh, do it to be found approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. That is, that we won't be ashamed at coming to a false conclusion or uh, misunderstanding the Word of God. Uh, and it says right here, dividing the Word of Truth. Or rightly dividing. If there's a right way, then there is a wrong way. In 1842, Miller's 14 adopted rules of prophetic interpretation were published and made available for the masses. Okay.
this is an important date as well and we'll we're gonna we're gonna see that <coughs> what date? uh 1842 I, know, but what was the month? I don't i don't have that oh, with no, me no. We'll, we'll we'll have that later if you want it en esa fecha fue cuando lo publicó para poder este para que todos lo puedan leer y estudiar por ellos mismos Okay. What happened? Not again. Okay. Sorry about that. And so he, after he studied, after he studied and uh, the Lord called him to preached those things that he was learning, he ran into conflicts with ministers of the time of those uh, other churches. It says, Mr. Miller is a great stickler of literal interpretations, never admitting the figurative unless absolutely required to make correct sense or meet the event which is in intended to be pointed out. He doubtless believes most of Unwaveringly, all he teaches to others, he lecture his lectures are interspersed with powerful admon admonitions to the wicked, and he handles universalism with gloves of steel. Okay, so first point here is that uh, when William Miller read the Bible and started to understand it and brought about the uh, he was able to adopt those rules of interpretation. He knew that whenever he read any verse of the Bible, the first thought is that it's literal. That's what that means, to be a stickler of literal interpretations. Okay? So, as it says here, never admit, admitting the figurative. So, in other words, he never said it was figurative unless there was a reason for that. Okay? And we know that through the rules that there's a way to know when a when a uh, a word is being used figuratively or literally, right? Do you remember that that rule? Okay, that would be rule number eleven. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So we should have that same mentality. The first thing we should think. When we're reading the Bible, we come to it as literal. If it's not making any sense, if it goes against the laws of nature in any way, okay, this means that uh, it's something that that we don't see here in the natural world, right? We're talking about a beast uh, rising up out of the the sea, okay. Right? Those things, we know that they're symbolic because they break the laws of nature. And so right here, we, we have the um, uh, the understanding that if any time we come to any verse, the first thing we need to have in mind that more than likely it's going to be literal. That's being a stickler for the literal. Um, and not admitting to the figurative unless absolutely required to make correct sense. Okay? Let's try to keep that in mind. So notice this as well. Ministers and people declared that the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation were incomprehensible mysteries. This is the arguments that would be brought forth by the ministers of the time. That the Revelation is a mystery. It can't be understood, they said. Okay? But Christ directed his disciples to the words of the prophet Daniel concerning events to take place in their time and said, Whoso readeth, let him understand. Okay? So what's that? what does that mean? That they can be understood. And it goes on to say, And the assertion that revelation is a mystery not to be understood is contradicted by the very title of the book, 
the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. The very name of the book, Revelation, lets us know that it's revealed. Basically what it's saying. Blessed is he that readeth, and any that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Says the prophet, blessed is he that readeth. There are those who will not read. The blessing is not for them. And they that hear, there are some also who refuse to hear anything concerning the prophecies. The blessing is not for this class. And keep those things which are written therein. Many refuse to heed the, the warnings and instructions contained in the revelation. None of these can claim the blessing promise. All who ridicule the subjects of the prophecy and mock at the symbols here solemnly given. All who refuse to reform their lives and to prepare for the coming of the Son of Man will be unblessed. In review of the testimony of inspiration, how dare men teach that the revelation is a mystery beyond the reach of human understanding? It is the mystery revealed, a book open. The study of revelation directs the mind to the prophecies of Daniel and both present. I'm at the... Uh, present most important instruction given a, of God to man concerning events that take place at the close of this world's history. And there was also a rejection of the message. Notice, those who rejected the first message could not be benefited by the second. Remember we were talking about the latter rain? That the latter rain, the early rain and the early rain, they don't contradict one another. Right? And it says right here, the first angel's message, those who rejected that message could not be connected uh, or could not be benefited by the second. And the second message said Babylon is fallen. They had no, they, they couldn't be benefited by that message because they had rejected the first. Neither were they benefited by the midnight cry, which was to prepare them to enter with Jesus by faith into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. So what do these two messages do? And the midnight cry as well? It prepares the way into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Remember we talked about the sanctuary? Remember? Yes. Okay. And so these two messages, they prepare the way to enter into that experience. It's an experience. Okay? And by rejecting the two former messages, they have so darkened their understanding that they can see no light in the third angel's message. That's, That's exactly what's happening. See? We might be able to understand some things of the third angel's message, but if we reject the first and second, we can't have that experience. And as we read in the first quote, in early writings, it says that we have to receive them from who? From those that gave it. From those that experienced in it. Those that let out in it. Right? They're rejecting the experience of the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And by rejecting the two former messages, they have so darkened their understanding that they can see no light in the third angel's message, which shows the way into the most holy place. I saw that the Jews crucified Jesus. Now listen to this. So the nominal churches had crucified these messages. And therefore, they have no knowledge of the way into the most holy place. Into the most holy and they cannot be benefited by the intercession of Jesus there. Well, you mean, can be rejected it or? Yes. 
We're talking about the first and second angel's messages. Remember, they closed the doors? They closed the doors to their churches? Because of the charts. Because of the, yeah, the charts, exactly. The messages contained on the chart. Here we have an appeal. To John were open scenes of deep and thrilling interest. In the experience of the church, she saw the position, dang the position, dangers, conflicts, and final deliverance of the people of God. He records the closing messages which are to ripen the harvest of the earth, either as sheaves for the heavenly garner or as faggots for the fires of destruction. Subjects of vast importance were revealed to him, especially for the last church. Those who should turn from their error to truth might be instructed concerning the perils and conflicts before them. None need be in darkness. I repeat that. None need be in darkness in regard to what is coming upon the earth. It's revealed. Why then this widespread ignorance concerning an important part of Holy Writ? Why this general reluctance to investigate its, investigate its teachings? It is the result of a studied effort of the Prince of Darkness to conceal from men that which reveals his deceptions. From this reason, Christ the Revelator, foreseeing the warfare that would be waged against the study of Revelation, pronounced a blessing upon all who should read, hear, and observe the words of prophecy. So who is leading the men to reject the messages? It's Satan. It is the enemy of souls. Jeremiah 6.16 Notice, thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways. There's many ways, right? Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Remember we started off with the landmark? Well, here it is. Here's the landmark. The good way, the old paths, right? But the majority say what? We will not walk therein. And it doesn't matter which portion of, of the angel's messages we reject. If we reject one, we reject all. Just like how James says, if you break one commandment, you break them all. Right? Pointing them the way, notice... And that's exactly what these, uh, the Adventists did, the leaders of the Adventist uh, movement. Many who embraced the third message had not had an experience in the two former messages. Satan understood this, and his, eye, his evil eye was upon them to overthrow them. Okay, so here after the after after the second angels. Angel's message had been given. The third message, uh, the third angel's message enters. There were some that accepted the third angel's message, okay, but they had not an experience in the in the former, in the first and second, right? It says here that Satan's evil eye was upon those to throw them off, to overthrow them. But the third angel was pointing them to the most holy place, right? That's what the third angel does. But notice, and those who had led, who had an experience in the past message, that's the first and second angel's message, were pointing them, those that had accepted the third, those that had an experience in the past messages, the first and second angel's messages, were pointing them the way to the heavenly sanctuary. See? And so Satan was hindering some 
from accepting the first and the second, even though they had accepted the third. Many saw the perfect chain of truth in the angels' messages. First, second, and third is a perfect chain of truth. Okay? It says, And gladly receive them in their order. There's an order to these messages. And must be received in order. And follow Jesus by faith into the heavenly sanctuary. These messages were repre re represented to me as an anchor to the people of God. And again, the illustration of a boat. When does it need an anchor? When the winds are tossing it to and fro, right? So it doesn't lose its place, right? They don't end up lost out in the sea. Though, and we apply this to what Paul said, the winds of doctrine, right? Mm -hmm. The winds of doctrine that blow us to and fro. Uh, these messages are an anchor. So we know where we are. So we know where we stand. And we cannot be tossed to and fro with the different winds of doctrine. Those who understand and receive them will be kept from the from being swept away by the many delusions of Satan. There it is very clearly. The many delusions are those false doctrines, those winds of doctrines that come in. And so if we have a good understanding of these messages, we'll be okay. We'll be fine. And now... We have completed our study. So, go ahead. Since, since you finished with him, uh, yeah, you could comment now. Go ahead. So, whoever didn't experience the first and second, <clears throat> uh, they, did they miss, uh, like, misinterpret or misunderstand <coughs> that Satan made them just to think that uh, the third angel's message was um, being, uh, was pointing them? To the most holy place instead of the heavenly sanctuary. Is that what I understand or no? Look. Okay, where do you where do you want me to read? Uh, from the, right there from the beginning. Many who embrace the third message. Okay, just the third. We're talking about those that need, we're gonna we're, 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 we're gonna we're just the way it's saying it right now. Right. Just, let's look so at the way it's saying it. The, so let's right now we're gonna have to just kind of get ahead of ourselves. Okay. In 1844, October 22nd, right? It's about to be, it's not a mystery that we're studying this right now. You know, it's, this is actually providential. I believe God wants oh, us to give this message right now. Um, it's always in season, but even more now because it's about to be the anniversary. Today is October the 21st. October 22nd, 1844, from that point forward, the third angel okay mm -hmm. so the third angel there was those that came in under that message from 1844 onward mm -hmm. anything prior to 1844 that's the first and second angels message yeah. okay gotcha. first and second so it's saying right here that many came in many embraced the third angel mm -hmm. after 1844 mm -hmm. okay but had not an experience in the two former messages. So that means prior to 1844, they missed out on that experience. And, the, and then and one and two is Babylon. Babylon has fallen. Right? That's the second angel's message. Right. So they, they missed out on that. And they also missed out on the prophetic periods mm -hmm. that lead us down to 1844. 1844, Christ enters into the most holy place, right? Who points, who points them to the most holy place? It's those that had an experience. Those that had an experience in, in the first two messages point those, point those that, had, that had not an experience. 
Does that make sense? Okay. So even though they came in after 1844, it was necessary for them to see what the messages, uh, the first and second angels' messages do. They point to the most holy place. Make sense? Okay, many who embraced the third angel's message had not had an experience in the two former messages. And then, and then it says, Satan understood this. Okay, they didn't, but Satan did. And his evil eye was upon them to overthrow them. Okay, and then it says, but the third angel was pointing them to the most holy place. Okay. I just say that's like a, a group. Uh huh. Now let's look at the other group. Okay, and the other it says, and those who had an experience in the past messages were pointing them the way. See, I understand that they're, like they're pointing them to two, to two different. Uh, uh huh. One what? the whole most holy place. Uh huh. That's the, the third angel. Here, the third angel. The, 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 yeah. The, the earthly one. Uh huh. Pointing them to the heavenly one, because that's the experience that that's what that's what they ended up. Uh, that's where they were mistakenly uh, uh, before. Actually, if you if you watch, pay close attention. Mm -hmm. Look, the third angel was pointing them to the most holy place. Boom. Yeah. Now let's just stop right there. Yeah. 1844, they realized their mistake. They realized that. It wasn't the sanctuary in, on earth that Christ, that Christ was going to go, go to. Yeah. It's going to be the sanctuary in heaven. Okay. It's the most holy place. They figured that out after 1844. We're talking about those that came in under the third angel's message after 1844. Well, even us, even if we, we come in... We're, we're coming in after. After, yeah. but, 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 but it's like if we come in with them, uh, with the ones that did have the experience, because remember, we go back to the ones that, yeah, that that's, had the experience. That's the importance. That's important. The importance is that we go back... So if we don't, we get stuck in the... In the, in the, in the third. In, in the, we get stuck like right here on the actual earthly sanctuary instead of the heavenly one. I don't see it mentioning the 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 third earthly. That's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah. To me, I I, I, the only I don't see, the, me see that is because it because it because it says that Satan, uh, that you know, it, uh, was uh, uh, he wanted to overthrow them. And oh. It says, but the third angel was pointing, pointing. Yes. Pointing okay. I see. I see what you're saying now. You know. I see what you're saying now. He's using it. He's twisting. I just to point it to the earthly one. Yeah, yeah. Of, uh, yes, movie. yes. You're right. And that's why. The yeah, that. Right there, that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. That's, that's where the. That, oh, yeah, all that comes in, remember? No, you're right. You're right. You're right. That 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 right there. What you just saw. Uh. That is like. Very fine detail, and not anybody could see that. That's not, not anybody can see that, uh, but you're right. Uh, he, no, because there is already, uh, there's already what, some teaching about that. Yeah, but remember mm -hmm. he said, but back when he said that, uh, that Satan was, right was, there. was, was, uh, yes. was trying to keep it like that. And they weren't was, able to, to enter into the, the heavenly, the heavenly experience, heavenly. the heavenly sanctuary experience. You're right. This is where. Satan would overthrow those. That gets stuck at the, with yeah, the earthly. Yeah, with the earthly. That's, mm -hmm. Uh huh. However, but notice it says many had embraced in the third third message had not had an experience in the two former messages. Satan understood this, mm -hmm. and his evil eye was upon them to overthrow them. He used that. He used that. But remember. Anybody coming in after 1844, and there were some pioneers that did. Mm -hmm. 
they're not gonna be, okay. they're not gonna be accountable. They won't be. Uh, no, they. Issue, at this point, they are. They uh, after 1844, they're yeah, they're accountable. After that, yeah. yeah. After. Uh. Because then it gives you the group that did, and those who had an experience in the in the past uh, messages were pointing them. See, they were they were pointing them to the heavenly one. I, I want to point out the the distinction between the heavenly one and the no no the distinction of what the third angel ma message does mm -hmm. the third angel what he does and then what the first and second angel does mm -hmm. okay it says right here it says but the third angel was pointing them to the most holy place straightforward mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. it teaches the experience of the most holy place mm -hmm. Third angel. Mm -hmm. Now notice what was what does the first and second angel message do? It says, and those who had who who had an experience in the past messages, that's the first and second message, were pointing them. That's those that had ex had embraced only the third message. Mm -hmm. Pointed them the way, the way. The way to the heavenly sanctuary. Remember when they had the study, when they went back to 50, that one had the, the study, mm -hmm. the white, white, mm -hmm. what, what went wrong with uh, 50? Mm -hmm. After, after uh, 50,500. That's when they figured out the way uh, to the heavenly one. So it was, it was mm -hmm. the ones that, that experienced the, the first and second. Here's the difference. I'm just going to make it very <laughs> clear. <laughs> the third angel points to the heavenly sanctuary. The first and second point the way. Okay. The way. El camino. El camino hacia el... Uh -huh. how, to, how to get to the third angel. It's how to get to the third angel. Because if you don't have the first and second, you misinterpret the third. Exactly. Exactly. Si estás viendo eso? So, you can't just give the third. No. No. And that's the problem. And that's the problem. And that's why we read in the first quote, we need to receive it from who? From, the, from, the ones that experienced it. from those that experienced it. But the main message is uh, Babylon, Babylon has fallen. So repent now. Repent. You know, to repent and, and, and right. Well, no, you, them you're you're them you you're know. right, but you you might understand what that means, but people that hear you that have never heard the first and second, okay. they're not gonna understand what you're talking so about. We're gonna go through. That's why we're gonna go through. Okay. And this is just the introduction. Wow. It was necessary for us to understand this in order for us to understand how it all works, because it's the perfect chain of truth. It doesn't okay? like say it's all intertwined. It all it all, it's all intertwined. It, it all combines that. You still have to repent. Yes, of course. Okay. But people won't know what, what to repent from unless they hear the messages oh, okay. coming from them. Okay. Not from me, because I wasn't there. All right. I came in after... Uh... Yeah, when you were born. <laughs> <laughs> no, born. 1980. Yeah. Right. So we're going to listen... We're going to listen to the message directly from them. Okay. Because that's what matters. Okay. Well, it doesn't matter. She, ex she was in the message, but she did not give it. She was there. Remember she was but she didn't give it. And that's going to be, yeah, that's going to be the difference. It's, it's important. It's fine detail. Just like you saw right here. The fine detail is that we need to give it from the ones that gave it. James White didn't give it. He wouldn't. No, Ellen White didn't give it. Yes, they they're the pioneers of the third message. Yeah, but the, we're, talking about we're talking about those that actually gave the first and second. And in order for us to be safe from the delusions, we need to receive it from the ones that gave it and had an experience in it. And if we don't, if we don't get it from them. Then it, we it, we're better off not studying it. We're better off leaving this alone because it must be given 
in its order and must be given the way they gave it. And this is the reason why the, the confusion within even the One True God movement. They say, oh, well, uh, James White, and then they, didn't, they didn't give this message. Yeah. Well, because they're not part of the first angel and second angel. No, they weren't teaching with the charts. Yeah, they weren't the ones that were out there uh, sacrificing everything mm -hmm. for what they were, were uh, believing. They sacrificed under the third angel, yeah. and that's after 1844. Okay, all right, so let's remember this, okay, because it's going to be important whenever we and I'll bring it up if, if uh, yeah. as, as we continue uh, to study, okay.